Hello, welcome to NPTEL NOC, an introductory course on point set topology part 2. Today we will have the last section on the dimension theory. Module 44, local separation to global separation. Recall that our study of dimension theory began actually in the previous chapter with a discussion of separation properties which we have named S0 to S3. Keeping in mind that we are going to restrict the class of topological spaces for those which are separable and metrizable and in particular T1 we have pointed out earlier that S1, S2 and S3 are some stronger forms of Hausdorffness, regularity and normality respectively. We may call this itself the first step in the passage from local to global. Moreover, the passage from SI to S3, S1 to S3, there is one S2 in between, itself can be viewed as a passage from atom to mass, atomic to aggregate or whatever you want to say, mini school to largeness and so on. A kind of local to global, that is also you can say is the passage from local to global. Recall that one of the first few results that we proved in the previous chapter is that Lindelof plus S2 implies S3. So that made S2 our central object of study. Next, in this chapter we adopted S2 to represent zero dimensionality and then inductively obtained its higher dimensional versions to define higher dimension manifolds. Then came the theorem 9.13 and 9.15 which you may term as another step toward globalization. Let me just show you these steps. So this was the theorem if you have subspace of metrizable space, separable metrizable space, then x has dimension less than or equal to n, if and only if given any closed subset C of x and a point outside, there is a closed subset D of x such that dimension of D is less than or equal to n minus 1 and x minus D is equal to A separated B. A and B are both open and closed subset disjoint with P inside A and C inside B. So, we have pointed out that in the case of n equal to 0, dimension of D is minus 1 means D is empty set, this is precisely the condition S2. Right? So, similarly, the 9.15 Okay, we can also similar things. I just wanted to show you one of them. So here, if X is a metrizable space and X prime is a subspace of that, dimension of X prime is less than or equal to n, if and only if for every point P inside X. Now I am putting conditions on points of X altogether. You see, I am getting condition like that. Condition is uh, dimension of X prime is less than or equal to n. What is the relation between points inside X and point uh, the subspace being dimension less than equal to n? So that step is again another step towards globalization. This is what we meant. Okay. So let's go back to what we are doing today. So as the inventor inventor had termed it, 
the success of the concept of this theory of dimension why i am calling this theory because there are other theories also hinges upon successfully strengthening the passage from local to global this is the topic of this last section wherein we shall be able to reach our goal the final goal of proving that the topological dimension of the euclidean space rn is actually equal to n so that i call it as a success of the theory here is the next step in the passage from local to global okay so we have to prove all these things now let x be any separable metric space a is a subset of x of dimension 0 given any two disjoint closed subsets c1 and c2 there exists a closed subset b of x separating c1 and c2 such that a intersection b is empty the c1 and c2 are disjoint closed subsets by normality you can separate them by open set that is a different aspect of course that will be the starting point in the proof of this what we are going to do is there is a separation okay by a closed subset b which does not intersect a at all okay so this you can call it as really the crunching of uh, of course we have to improve on this also of uh, you know the separation properties being you know globalized globalization problem here so let us start uh, the proof of this we have to produce a closed subset b of a b of x contained in the complement of a such that when you throw away this b x x minus b can be written as disjoint union of clopen sets v1 and v2 c1 contained inside v1 C two contained inside V two. That is the meaning of separation of X minus B. Choose open sets U I, I equal to one and two, such that U one bar intersection U two bar is empty, and C I s are inside U I. So this step is just merely the metric space property here, uh, normal as normal property of a metric space. Okay. So that's all we are using here. Once we have this u1 and u2, look at their intersection with a. In fact, take u i bar intersection a. These will be disjoint subsets of a, and a is of dimension zero. So apply the S2 property there. Okay. We have a equal to c1 prime separation c2 prime here. U i bar intersection a is inside c i prime. Okay, so that is the de definition for uh, that is the property for uh, for the zero dimensional set. Now you enlarge the C one prime C two prime along with C I. So put F I equal to C I union C I prime. I equal to one and two. Okay, look at these C one s are subsets of A C one C I primes. C one C two s are subsets of the larger space X. Okay. C I C I S are closed. C I S are closed inside A, but A itself is not closed inside X. So there is some problem here. Otherwise, F I S would have been easily, uh, you know, you can take it as closed subset. Do I take it as a closed subset? No, it's here this dimension zero. That's the point. Yeah. So we shall show that F one and F two are mutually separated sets. Which is stronger than saying just disjoint closed subsets. Okay, so I mean they are not closed subsets, but F1 bar separates is doesn't intersect F2, and F2 bar doesn't intersect F1. So mutually separated subsets. So which is slightly weaker hypothesis than having disjoint closed subsets. Disjoint closed subsets are easy to separate. So this is little more. So for here we will need. More than normality, namely complete normality. Wait a minute. So let us have this one now. How to prove that this one, namely f1 bar intersection f2 is empty? Indeed, 
once you prove this one the other one is symmetrical all these things are conditions are symmetrical in the other one so that will also prove exactly same way. okay so once you have that use complete normality of the metric space it follows that we get open subset w in x such that f1 is inside w and closure of w does not intersect f2 this is same thing as having disjoint row subsets and so on okay this this way it is easier to state f1 contained is a w closure of w does not intersect f2 you can then take b as the boundary of w automatically boundary of w is closed so this b is a closed subset which will separate f1 and f2 because f1 will be contained inside w doesn't intersect uh, b f2 doesn't intersect b because it doesn't intersect w bar at all so f1 and f2 are inside that one if you take w union complement of w bar that will be precisely equal to the whole x minus boundary of w namely x minus b okay so moreover if you look yeah that's what i have showed b intersection a okay is empty because why i just uh, why this is uh, this i have not just shown what i have shown f1 and f2 are disjoint from w moreover we want to ensure that b intersection a is empty but b intersection a b is boundary of w boundary of w intersection f1 union boundary of w intersection f2 okay because this entire a is union of c1 prime and c2 prime and f1 and f2 contain c1 prime c2 prime so a is contained in the f1 and f2 therefore this intersection is intersection with f1 union intersection with f2 but both of them are empty okay just now we showed that so this b will serve the purpose all right so we have yet to find out that one so here is the, the schematic picture of what is happening started with c1 and c2 which are disjoint closed subsets these ellipses then enclose them in open subsets u1 and u2 so that closure of u1 and closure of u2 are disjoint intersected u1 with a this is my say a is of dimension 0 that's why i have shown like dot 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 here okay intersect that with a1 so that you get some subset here like this okay up to u1 here similarly from here to here all right so they are disjoint inside a and they are disjoint over subset so you can separate them by c1 prime and c2 prime so c1 prime and c2 prime may go out of u1 you see they may they may be out of this one so it, it, here it might come even out of u2 also here to here and so on so of course this dot 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 sir dot 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 ellipses indicate that after all an open subset of subset of a is nothing but some open subset inside x intersected with a so that is what i have shown here then i put f1 equal to c1 union this c1 prime up to here c2 union c2 prime up to here i have to show that they are mutually separated in the picture it's obvious you can't use the picture to prove a theorem okay you can take the help but finally everything should be purely logical ha huh? and finally what we want is this green thing w such that its closure okay does not intersect this f2 c1 prime union c2 prime and this boundary if you take boundary if you throw away that you get a separation all right so let us prove first of all that these two namely c1 union c1 prime c2 union c2 prime they are disjoint and mutually separated is what i have shown or rejection so let us do that 
so it remains to prove 31 31 is that this f1 bar intersection f2 is empty okay the other one is similar so by symmetry it is enough to prove that f1 bar intersection f2 is empty first of all f1 bar f1 itself is c1 union c1 prime therefore f1 bar bar denotes now everything denotes happening inside x okay closures are inside the whole space x f1 bar is c1 bar union c c1 prime bar because it's just a union of you know finite union but c1 is already closed so it is c1 union c1 prime bar therefore it is enough to check that c1 intersection f2 okay this is c1 intersection f2 and c1 prime intersection f2 they are empty then f1 bar intersection f2 will be empty so this is the first step i have to show these two things now just to show one of them i have to show these two things okay so let us see now c1 is inside u1 by the very choice u1 u1 is an open subset containing c1 hence c1 intersection a is u contained in u1 intersection a contained in u1 bar intersection a but u1 bar intersection a is c1 prime okay and hence c1 intersection c2 prime is contained inside c1 prime intersection c2 prime okay just now c1 intersection a is already in c1 prime c1 intersection c2 c2 prime is inside the subset of a so i can take intersection with uh, a itself so that's contained in c1 prime intersection c2 prime and that is empty to begin with okay so instead of c1 intersection f2 i have looked at c1 intersection uh, c2 f2 has two two parts right what is c2 and c2 prime the c2 prime okay so c1 intersection what will be here c1 intersection uh, f2 will be c1 intersection c2 which is empty c1 intersection c2 prime okay so this intersection is now c1 intersection c2 prime now what is what is happening to this one so c1 intersection c2 prime is again a intersection c1 intersection c2 prime everything we have in c2 prime a intersection u1 bar intersection c2 prime because a, c1 is contained in u1 bar okay so but that is contained in c1 prime intersection u prime so that is empty okay so i am more or less repeating this one here all right next to show that c1 prime intersection f2 is empty okay so how do you show there are two parts f1 bar has two parts right one we one we showed the second part is this one now this one i have to show for each x belonging to f2 we shall produce a neighborhood of x which does not meet c1 prime then it will follows that that point is not in the closure of c1 prime because the whole neighborhood doesn't intersect that if x is inside c2 there are two point, um, uh, parts to f2 one is c2 and one is c2 prime if c2 you can just take v equal to whole of this u2 for all the points inside c2 take just v because v which is equal to u2 here is contains the whole of c2 okay and then v u2 is not uh, intersection uh, intersection uh, uh, c1 prime is empty right so u2 intersection a which is contained inside u2 bar intersection a that's contained inside c2 prime and hence u2 intersection c1 prime is u2 intersection a intersection c1 prime which is contained in c2 prime intersection c1 prime that is empty so method is the same but argument are completely different that part takes one part if x is in c2 prime then what do i do but c2 prime is an open subset of a it's actually closed open subset right because separation okay c2 prime is also open inside a 
so we get an open set v this time it's a different uh, v i have to choose okay so this v is inside x open such that v intersection a is this c2 prime open subset of a then what happens v intersection c1 prime is v intersection a intersection c1 prime that is c2 prime intersection c1 prime okay that is contained inside that one so that is also again so separately we have shown that c1 prime intersection f2 as well as c1 intersection f2 are empty which just means that f1 bar intersection f2 is empty so similarly f1 intersection f2 bar is also empty and that completes the proof now we can state a more uh, pliable statement and easy to remember statement start with any separable elementary space take a subset of dimension less than or equal to n where n itself is finite of course i assume bigger than equal to 0 because if a is empty there is no statement the, those things we have seen already so given any two disjoint closed subsets c1 and c2 inside x there exists a closed subset b of x separating c1 and c2 such that the subset a intersection b okay has dimension less than or equal to n minus 1 okay so from zero dimension we have come to arbitrary dimension here now okay so how do we do that of course x is a metric space there exist open subsets u and u2 such that ci is r inside ui i equal to 1 and 2 and intersection u and u2 is empty this is normality because c1 and c2 are disjoint closed subsets now suppose n is 0 that is n is between 0 and infinity right so n is 0 there are two cases to be handled if a is empty in which case we can take b equal to u1 union u2 complement that's a closed subset and uh, x minus b is just disjoint union of u1 and u2 over okay that's what when uh, when this is uh, zero otherwise dimension of a is zero it cannot be minus 1 okay in which case the first earlier lemma which we did just now that we give you the required result so we have the inductive hypothesis here now suppose n is bigger than 0 using a previous corollary we can write a as union of two subsets d and e where dimension of d is less than equal to n minus 1 and dimension of e is less than equal to 0 this is one of the sum theorem that we have derived last time right now you use the above lemma to give a closed subset b huh, which separates c1 and c2 such that b intersection e is empty i don't know what is happening to d we will come to that later but e part is empty that is the the starting point with uh, n equal to 0 but then this implies to take a intersection b that will be now contained inside d but d is of dimension n minus 1 less than or n minus 1 so intersection of uh, a, a intersection b is also of dimension less than or n minus 1 okay so this after hard work of lemma this comes quite easily by of course i have to use this crucial thing here namely anything which is of dimension n can be written as union of two subsets one is dimension n minus 1 another one is 0 now in the above theorem take a equal to well this was not a theorem it is a proposition it doesn't matter take a equal to x then what do i get let x be of dimension less than equal to n then any two disjoint closed subsets can be separated by a closed subset of dimension 
less than or equal to n minus 1. Okay, so no question of intersecting with A because A is the whole space X now. Now we want to improve upon that one. Let X be of dimension less than or equal to n and C1, C2, C3 and similarly this C1 prime, C2 prime, C3 prime, etc. pairwise disjoint closed subset. C i intersection C i prime is empty that is the meaning of that. How many are there? n plus 1 this dimension is less than equal to n. There are n plus 1 pairs of disjoint closed subset. Then there exists a closed subset B i there exists closed subsets B i how many n plus 1 of them such that each B i separates C i and C i prime and intersection of B i I range from 1 to n plus 1 is empty all right. So, how do you get this one this is also easy from the previous theorem apply to C 1 and C 1 prime you get a closed set B 1 which separates C 1 and C 1 prime such that dimension of B 1 is less than equal to n minus 1. Now, use the proposition or the theorem we get a closed subset of of x again subset B 2 separating C 2 and C 2 prime such that when you intersect it with B 1 its dimension is less than to n minus 2 because you already n minus 1 dimension. Now, you call keep on doing this you know repeat this step get a B 3 such that it separates C 3 and C 3 prime with dimension of B 1 intersection B 2 intersection B 3 to n minus 3 how far you can go till you have minus 1 and that is empty. Sir. So, you have to have dimension less than equal to n here and there must be n plus 1 of them then only you will achieve that. All right. Now, we are very close to the end here. Okay. The rectangle or rectangular box minus 1 to plus 1 interval raised to n contained inside R n. Okay. Suppose you have C i plus and C i minus denote its faces uh, defined by equation x i equal to plus minus 1. If you just n equal to 1, this is nothing but C i minus 1 and C i minus C i plus is plus 1, that is all. If n equal to 2, there will be 4 faces, pair of 2 of 2 pairs of opposite faces, right. So, that is the way you have to take these faces defined by the equation the coordinate x i equal to plus minus 1, ok. Now, for 1 less than to i less than to n, there are n pairs here. Suppose B i is a closed subset of J n bar which separates the opposite faces C i plus and C i minus. It just means that when you throw away B i from J n bar, you get two open subsets, each of them containing C i plus or C i minus, one of them containing the other, this way, okay, that is separation. Suppose you have got these B i s like this, then we want to show that intersection of B i is non empty. The crucial thing here is what there are only n of them. The previous theorem says if there are n plus 1 of such things then it is empty. So, together they are going to imply a big theorem for us. However, the proof of this is now based on something different that we did last time namely Brouwer six point theorem comes here. Okay. Let us see how. Pay attention to the method of proof because that can be used in several other places. Okay. Let D denote 
द यूक्लिडियन डिस्टेंस फंक्शन इन आर एन फॉर ईच एक्स इन यू आई प्लस आई हैव ओवरली टोल्ड यू वॉट आर यू आई प्लस यूर यू आई प्लस इज वॉट द ओपन सब्सेट कंटेनिंग सी आई प्लस एंड दिस वन इज कंटेनिंग सी आई माइनस यू आई माइनस सी आई माइनस ओके फॉर एक्स बिलोंग टू यू आई प्लस लेट पी आई be the root be the foot of the perpendicular from x to ci minus so this is a one of the faces so go all the way to ci minus from ui plus don't change the ith coordinate that's all the pi and x have the same ith coordinate it's the foot of the perpendicular from x to this plane then this is now elementary observation distance between x and bi bi is a subset which separates the two things right is less than or equal to distance between x and pi and this distance is actually equal to distance between x and ci minus why because pi is the foot of the perpendicular and what is this distance it is just 1 plus the ith coordinate of x okay similarly so what we have proved by this one is distance between x and bi is 1 plus xi distance between you know x and bi is less than or equal to 1 minus xi for every x inside ui minus This is for u i plus, and this is for u i minus. It's very easy to remember. Let me justify this one with a small picture here. N equal to two. Okay, so this is minus one to plus one, minus one to plus one, the product square. Okay, this is square, and this is c one plus x one coordinate. This is c one minus. This is C two minus, and this is C two plus. This is my B two. Separate C one minus and C two minus. Take a point in U two plus. This X. Take its projection onto this axis, onto this uh, plane. So here is just an axis. What is it? It is uh, X one coordinate will not change. What is its y coordinate? Y coordinate of this point, or x two coordinate of this point, is nothing but this x two coordinate here plus this one. The distance, sorry, the distance is this distance is one. This distance is x two, right? So distance between x and this one is same thing as distance between x and this part. Which is bigger than distance between x and b two, and that's precisely what we have proved. X b i less than to x b i, which is d x c i minus is m one plus x. Now I define a function here for one less than to i less than equal to n. Define f i from j n bar to r as follows. If x is in u i plus Just take it as distance between x and b i. That's a continuous function, right? We know that. What is this? This is the minimum of distance between x and little b i, where little b i runs over b i. If x is in u i minus, you put a minus sign there. If x is in b i, put a zero. Look at this one. If x is in ui bar it is this ui plus it is this one if it tends to a point you know if you take limit it tends to a point inside the boundary then this distance becomes zero right similarly this one also this will become zero so by these are continuous this f5 will be continuous because of that reason okay now you combine these two inequations here inequalities what you conclude is 
that minus 1 is always less than equal to xi minus fi of x is always less than equal to 1. So, there are two different cases you may have to work, you have to work out, that is very easy. Okay? You have to just use this and this one accordingly. Because there are definition, definitions are different, the function fi is differently defined, that is why. Okay? So, xi minus fi is between minus 1 plus 1. Therefore, if I define, okay, fx equal to f1, f2, fn and gx equal to x minus fx, then what happens? This is a function taking values inside Rn, but gx will be taking function inside Jn bar. It will be always between minus 1 plus 1, all the coordinates. So, obviously, both of them are continuous. Okay. Therefore, you have got a function from the closed rectangle j n bar to j n bar, you can apply Brouwer's fixed point theorem. So, we get a point x such that g x equal to x. What does that mean? f x equal to 0. What does that mean? What does that mean? f i of x equal to 0 for all i. What does that mean? x must be inside each of these bi, which means x is in the intersection of here. Okay? So, so that is the statement here. Okay, this theorem is proved now. As I told you, now you can combine this with the previous theorem, you get a wonderful result. Now, tight thing, namely, dimension of Jn bar has to be equal to n. Okay? Let me go through this one. It is not so clear. If not, dimension is always less than equal to n because, because of what? We know that this part we have already proved. Okay, dimension of r n less than equal to n and this is a subspace, so that part we have already proved. So, dimension must be less than equal to n minus 1. As soon as it is n minus 1, by our theorem uh, 9.38, whatever we have proved today, it means that so for each i 1 less than equal to i less than equal to 1, there exists n closed subset b i which separates c i plus and c i minus such that the intersection is empty. But Brouwer's fixed point theorem applied now just now to the previous theorem says this is non empty. So that is a contradiction to this theorem, right? 9.39. Therefore, dimension is tight, it has to be equal to n. Rn being a larger subspace of that, you know, containing Jn now, Jn bar already. So this dimension is also n. All right. So we have proved that not only this one you can you can take now any open subset, any take any open subset which is homeomorphic to some uh, Dn, Gn bar, and so on contains something, etc. Right? Any open subset will contain some some copy of this one. Therefore, all open subsets will be of dimension n inside R n. All non-empty open subsets, of course. So here is a remark: topological dimension, whatever you have defined, okay, is invariant for the class of separable metrizable spaces. We have not defined it for arbitrary spaces. That is one point you have to remember. Thus, we may also conclude that, you know, the Brouwer's invariance of domain, which is a weaker form of this one, weaker form of um, BID. So, I am go going to give that. Namely, Rn and Rm, if n is not equal to m, cannot be homeomorphic <coughs> because we have just shown that dimension of Rn is n, dimension of Rn is m, but dimension is a 
homeomorphism invariant. Okay, this is a weaker form of Brouwer's invariance domain. Of course, the the real uh, uh, Brouwer's invariance of domain is the following, which is uh, which is a, which is a stronger form of this one, namely take any two non-empty open subs non-empty subsets of Rn. Suppose they are homeomorphic. Then, if one of them is open, the other one is also open. And that is why the name invariance of domain. The word domain was used more often than just open subsets in the older days. So, being open is the same thing as being a domain, and that is an invariance. So, that is why it is called invariance of domain theorem. Okay. Unfortunately, we are not able to touch this one. We have come very close, but there is still a big uh, gap here. Okay. So, the proof of this will take us much deeper into dimension theory, which is beyond the scope of this course. The original proof due to Brouwer uses another topological dimension theory, namely Lebesgue covering dimension. In the modern times, it is fashionable to prove this using homology theory. So, there are many proofs of this, uh, this great theorem. But a proof using only simplicial approximation, which is actually uh, part of it is there in Horovitz Wallman implicitly, you may see in my book. So, here is a easy exercise for you. Deduce 9.42 from 9.43. Namely, this I said is a this stronger form I said. Why? So, prove you assume this and prove this one. Okay, we have proved it using the whole thing, using the all our uh, you know first uh, two two different chapters that we have studied so carefully. But assuming this, you prove this one. That is your exercise. Okay. All right. So next time we will start a new topic. Thank you.